Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Wong. Negro in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you? It is Monday. It's September 19th, 2016, and time for another show. Despite all efforts, <laughs> we're, we're back again. Monday comes so, so very quickly. And it was uh, and it was a heck of a weekend. Uh, Donald Trump bombed New York City. I think I, I think we're safe and just going right out and, and saying that, sir. I don't see why we couldn't. I mean, uh, we're not having a great influence on the election as it stands now. So maybe we should just go the Alex Jones route and do a sort of info wars approach to the election and just hey, you know, blurt this stuff out. Like, why not? Because the difference because Donald Trump does it and he gets to say uh, well he gets to blurt out that it's a bomb before anybody knows that it's a bomb ooh mysterious that he had some inside information hmm hmm yes we're revealing the conspiracy right now and uh, you know uh, just so happens they come up with a second device about the time that his deplorable Twitter followers are losing the Twitter argument Proving that it's, oh my goodness, well, somebody just went out and dumped a pressure cooker in a trash can and called 911 and the police just happened to find it. Oh my God. Hey, you know, anything could be true. There's really no reason to just stick to facts or wait for evidence to come in. I can't really argue in favor of that anymore. I guess it's just time to do what you feel, you know. If it feels like you want to blame terrorism on Donald Trump, go for it. If it feels like you want to say that we're not fighting ISIS, even though we're bombing them a couple hundred times a week, just go ahead. Just go on. Just do it. If it feels good, do it, right? Okay, no more PC, right? Uh, We're throwing political correctness out. And so some of that has to go, right? Some of this stuff about waiting for proof or, or evidence or... Uh, clearance from the government. Please don't spill the beans on these stupid briefings that we have to give you because your idiotic party has been dumb enough to nominate you. Whatever. You just go ahead. Say what you like. Do the do it the way you want to. It'll be fine. Everyone will come out just great. It'll be great for the economy. Jobs will start coming back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so anyway, not a very satisfying weekend in terms of uh, being rid of the menace of Donald Trump. <clears throat> I didn't really have high expectations on that front, though I I didn't think we were going to be rid of him all that quickly. Uh, Yes, I noticed that my Skype is now not open, so I'll reopen that so we can get ready to have Greg Dworkin join us. Uh, Greg, I understand, has already been challenged on Twitter by Armando. There's going to be a knockdown drag out, by which I mean these two guys will discuss some issues, and I will have the rest of my breakfast. Provided, of course, Skype will cooperate and uh, open up and let us go. And so I I noted uh, my my big worry was, hey, I haven't gotten a thumbs up from Justice just yet. But uh, I see it's come through now. Just my Skype wasn't. I'm getting worried about Skype. Kind of limping along. Maybe I'll have to do something about tuning up the old computer here and making sure that it's running smoothly. But uh, so far, anyway, in terms of piping the show out, We seem to be pretty good. Bringing things into the show continues to be uh, a question mark. Okay. Well, anyway, there's plenty to pipe out today. We know that. Um, Of course, over the weekend, you would have caught up with the fact that there were, in fact, explosions and in two places. And so that makes you nervous a little bit, a little, you know, it raises eyebrows, certainly. It's not a good thing. Uh, we're not hearing much about the one in New Jersey, and I think it has to do with the fact that it doesn't appear to have injured anybody. But uh, a, a more calculated strike, I guess, in that it was along the route of a, eh, not a major thing, but, a, you know, a foot race today. And, uh, or, or the other day, you know, a, a Marine Corps affiliated, a sponsored uh, road race that had the bomb gone off at 
you know, at the wrong time. I was going to say at the right time. At the right time if you're a terrorist. Wrong time if you're everybody else. Uh, that could have done some damage. And we're not talking about the scale of the Boston uh, Marathon, uh, either the race itself or or the explosive device. But between that and then there was also a stabbing attack at a mall in Minnesota. So... I, I've always wondered about that. I've always wondered if they really wanted to create widespread panic with the uh, w- with low level uh, dispersed network terrorism. That there would be, you, know, you would think that the thing they would do would have it would be to uh, have these sort of constant low level attacks in places that don't make any particular sense. Just to, just to emphasize the point that it could happen anywhere. The New York City bomb just. Uh, very lazy terrorist, if that's what's going on here, I must say. They picked a really sleepy section of a, of a, of a city that doesn't sleep, supposedly. And, uh, I don't really know what the decision making process there was beyond, hey, let's explode something. But, uh, I don't know. It uh, doesn't fit the normal pattern, but, well, what does? Uh, I suppose there's no such thing as a normal pattern anymore, anyway. Uh, Greg can tell us about that. Greg, good morning. How you doing? Greg Dwarf, hey, joining we're us doing great. Connecticut. Okay, good. Connecticut nope. is just fine. Yeah, no bombs. That's good. No, it's fall and it's gorgeous and uh, there are people out. We had an arts festival yesterday and no bombs went off yeah, and you know terrific. it was fun and had great ice cream from the local uh, dairy farm, which uh, also makes their own homemade ice cream and it's just fantastic. And uh, of course, we heard about everything that happened in New York. And New Yorkers reacted in the way New Yorkers usually react. You know, they kept going to bars and they kept going out. Gelato and uh, everybody else who wasn't in New York uh, was freaking yeah. out. The New Yorkers were, okay, you know, whatever. Yeah, including uh, Donald Trump, really, uh, who made it raised the panic, of course. But and, and oh, my God, New York is under attack. Where did he where did he sleep that night? Uh, we don't know. Hmm. New York. But uh, chances are it was in his, uh, you know, penthouse. But, you know, it's Donald Trump, you know, who just sounds glad whenever there's any kind of... um, The Romney smirk comes back. Yeah, well, anytime there's some kind of terrorist attack, it's, look, I called it. Mm -hmm. You know, this is like the fifth time he's done this. And uh, maybe uh, you shouldn't be so happy about terrorism attack. It's not about you. Huh. Yeah, perhaps not. Yeah, well, all he does is every time he hears that something has gone wrong is he goes out and he says... It was, it's a major terrorist attack, and then life goes on. Well, let, let's let's look at the pundits <clears throat> and see what they're saying about this in general. Sure. And uh, we have uh, NBC News uh, first read. I always like reading that, Mark Murray and company. First. First read, Trump grabs the spotlight again in all the negative ways. Oops. Remember, uh, to set the context here. And we'll be talking about this a little bit before we get to that fantastic uh, uh, set of polls that we have to talk about this morning. Mm -hmm. But uh, back on Friday, which seems like a lifetime away, Donald Trump uh, moved the media around by the nose and got them all to show up on false pretenses to one of his newly opened uh, D.C. hotels and got the media to give him an infomercial about the hotel by promising to talk about birtherism, which he did for about, uh, I don't know, 10 seconds. And in the process, did the one thing that you're not supposed to do with media. Sure, he lies all the time. That's not only a given, it's been shown. And PolitiFact has done this, 80% of the stuff he says is false. We know that. The media knows that. They don't really care. They don't really care about the issues. They don't care about his birtherism. They don't care about racism. They don't care about xenophobia. But they really do care when you lie to them. Yes, that bothers them. That really bothers them. So now you have the media brought out on false pretenses to this uh, uh, hotel for this uh, promised press conference. turns out not to be a press conference because he gets out, he makes a statement, uh, and then uh, tries to put the birtherism behind him by saying Obama was born in the United States, period, and then goes ahead and lies and says Clinton started it and then walks off the stage. (laughs) Then, to, to add insult to injury, tries to get the media to do a tour of the hotel. First of all, he was an hour late. And so he kept live media there broadcasting a commercial for him before he came on and did his 10-second thing. 
And then uh, he wanted the producers and the camera people to go do a tour of the hotel and broadcast that on cable as well, if he could possibly get that. But he wouldn't let the reporters go. Hmm. So they all get ticked off. And what winds up happening is a series of uh, stories that are showing up in the media for the first time that simply were not there before. On Saturday, on the Pundit Roundup I did on Saturday, the graphic I I did was just taking a New York Times, Washington Post, and one from Vice, and, and just listen to the headlines and say, you know, Friday is the day that this started. You can actually put a date on it. News analysis from the New York Times, unwinding a lie, Trump's long embrace of birtherism. Vice says Trump just admitted Obama was born in the U.S. while spreading a new lie. Eric Wemple in Washington Post, how Donald Trump swindled cable news. I love swindled because that's exactly what he is. He's a swindler. Trump drops false birther story but floats a new one. Clinton started it. Trump acknowledges Obama was born in the U.S., falsely blames Clinton for rumors. It's time for TV news to stop playing the stooge for Trump. That's Margaret Sullivan now writing in the Washington Post instead of the New York Times, which has dropped its public editor quality by half because hmm. she moved. The New York Times public editor is still apologizing for false equivalency while all this is going on. And then uh, another one, Clinton, Trump owes Obama an apology over the birther issue. The birther issue is not going away. There's a really nice piece in uh, BuzzFeed as it happens uh, from yesterday. Uh, Trump surrogates are spreading false claims to defend his birtherism. Like their candidate, Donald Trump's backers, are falsely accusing Hillary Clinton of starting the birther conspiracy. Basically, media is now ready to call Donald Trump a liar when he's a liar, which is basically every day. And his surrogates were doing the same thing. Chris Christie in particular, uh, Kelly oh, and yeah, Conway, wow. the usual suspects, are on TV just lying through their teeth and getting called on it, you know, some to some extent or other. Some better than others. Obviously, some do a better job of this than others. But that's new. It's all different. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I, it's nice. It's, uh, it's what we've been asking for. I, although I still, uh, I'm waiting to see plugs be pulled on some of these guys. Yeah, well, you're going to have to stop lying. Well, I'm not like, well, pew. oh, well. Well, well get at the guest. end of that uh, uh, press conference, uh, in air quotes, at the D.C. hotel, huh. Cable refused to show the cameras yes. going around the hotel. So that was the one time they actually pulled something. Uh, yeah, that, I, I, I read something about that. They erased the tape of something, but I... Yeah, they refused to show it, and then they erased the tape. Hmm. So here's AP, Julie Pace from AP, and uh, we know how AP has been uh, basically stenographing the whole uh, problem. You know, Trump, Clinton, discuss birtherism. Ah. But uh, they're a little bit better. Uh, This is from September 17th, so again, it's a Saturday. With each scripted Mm. speech, shift in policy, and attempt to whitewash his past behavior, Donald Trump is brazenly betting that voters now settling on their choice for president are willing to shove aside all that came before his late in the campaign recalibration. It's a deeply uncertain proposition, given Trump's staggeringly negative standing with most Americans. Polls show more than half believe the Republican nominee is unqualified and is biased against women and minorities, but a strategy doesn't require moving huge segments of the electorate. And then they're talking about fighting for a small sliver of undecided voters, which is actually not right. And I'm sure Armando and I will have a lot to say about that when it Mm. comes to Florida. Yes. But in any case, there's no question that the way the press is approaching Trump as of Friday through Monday, we'll see if it lasts, is quite different than it was before. Will that move the needle? One never knows. My uh, whole uh, theory about how people react to stuff like this is not so much. I mean, if you're a Trump voter, you're going to just get reinforced and get your back up and say, no, I'm voting for him anyway. And if you're not a Trump supporter, you're going to say, see, this is why we don't vote for him. Mm -hmm. But that's almost not the point. Uh, the point is motivating people to actually come out and vote. And we see that because we know that there's a difference between the registered voters where uh, Clinton has a solid and uh, continuing lead and the likely voters and likely voter models. She loses a few points. And what's the difference? Likely voters are enthusiastic about coming out for Trump and they're not clearly enthusiastic yet about coming out for Clinton, although that may change. And Weekends like this and events like this and the media covering Trump, calling him a liar like this, Obama being out on the trail, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, all that stuff is designed to uh, get the base to come out, not so much to convince the unconvinced voter. Oh. An unconvinced voter who hasn't made up their mind by now 
either can't or won't. And so, you know, it's not worth spending a whole lot of time on them. What you yeah. need to do is you need to get your base who already decided that they are uh, uh, favorably inclined to you to actually get out and vote, which is important because early voting starts now. It's already started. That's true in some I places. Think Wisconsin starts today. That's what I heard, which I also heard today. It, once again, it snuck up on me. Talk like a pirate day. Right. Missed it. So anyway, uh, back to first read. So they uh, says Trump grabs the spotlight in all the negative ways, and that's why the negative ways matter. What are we talking about? He revived the birther story. He said Clinton's Secret Service protection should disarm. He attacked former Defense Secretary Robert Gates. He went after the New York Times Maureen Dowd, tweeting she's wacky and neurotic. That may be true, but it's just not something you're supposed to do. And he tweeted that his lawyers want to sue the New York Times. They want to sue the yes. failing New York Times so badly for irresponsible intent, as if there is such a thing. I'm not a lawyer, and I don't play one <laughs> no. on the Internet. Actually, Armand is an expert on this. Yeah. So Trump makes up this category of thing that you can sue somebody about in terms of trying to intimidate them. Yes. And then a bomb went off in the same city as this newspaper he hates. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I'm that just means. saying people are talking about it. Right. So, uh, Clinton's hitting Temple University today. She penned an op-ed to Millennial Voters, uh, which was published at NBC News. Not with an actual pen, though, right? They don't... Uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren out on the trail. And then uh, there were two big polls that came out this weekend for two really important states. Okay. One of them, Pennsylvania, and the Muhlenberg uh, Morning Consult poll. The Morning Consult poll comes out every Sunday, by the way. Still shows Clinton with a plus-four lead. Uh, and uh, the uh, Muhlenberg Morning Consult poll of Pennsylvania shows Clinton up nine, which is pretty important. So that firewall is holding. And then this morning, uh, something new, the Upshot uh, uh, partnered with Siena College, and they have a poll of Florida. And of uh, 867 likely voters, Clinton 41, Trump 40 in a four-way, and I guess it's tied in the two-way. She's up by four with registered voters, again, pointing out why it's important to work on that get-out-the-vote so you make the registered voters look more likely voters. Okay. It's true that every single year we go through this, well, are the registered voters correct? Are the likely voters correct? What's a better model to use? What's the right thing to do? So what the upshot did with Siena was really innovative for a media poll. They did it more like the campaign polls do. They are basing it on voter records, not just dialing random digit dialing phones. The advantage of random digit dialing phones is even if you uh, make random the phone calls that you're going to make, you basically get everybody so long as they have a a phone that's in the state. But Uh you don't really know whether or not that's the right universe of people to do. So by doing the voter lists... You get a much better idea of who's actually registered, did they turn out, and so on and so forth. And what they found, basically, is that Trump leads Clinton by 51 to 30 among white voters. And that's all white voters, not just those without a college education. So she's winning white voters uh, in Florida. Uh, he's winning white voters in Florida. And uh, even Democrats are voting for Clinton 63-17 if you're a white voter. So she's... Uh, got some room to improve there. But on the other hand, Clinton is going to be record-setting among Hispanic voters. She leads Trump by 40 points, 61 to 21. That's more than doubling the 18-point margin Obama had and doing well among black voters, too. And as the article points out, though not quite matching the huge margin or the enthusiasm that Obama enjoyed in 2012, at least not yet, and at least not yet is the key, because basically what it is is a roadmap of who to motivate and who to work on in terms of get out the vote. And that's why looking to see whether undecided voters are warm or cold really is not the play. It's going to these voters that you need to turn out to support you. And that's really what the election is about. So as long as Pennsylvania stays a firewall, and it looks like it is based on that uh, polling, there's really no polling showing Trump pulling even. At the same time, uh, Florida is what Florida always was. Steve Shale said way back, don't pay any attention to polls showing Clinton in the lead or whatever. Florida is close. It's a mixture of uh, many, many different areas. It's uh, it's not really a single state. And the bottom line is at the end of the day, Florida is going to be close. 
Hmm. No yeah, kidding. I. This is Armando. Hey, Armando, and, and, and Armando knows calling, calling calling Greg on his first in, uh, inaccuracy. <laughs> Let, let, I, Florida. There's, Florida might be close, but Florida might not be close. Aha! Are you definitive about that? Yes, and let me tell you what I mean, because <laughs> I know it sounds like just nonsense. It sounds like you're not. Go on. Okay. Be, it, it, look, I thought the Snake Cone article on their poll was fantastic. If you want to understand what this ele- what's at play in this election in terms of winning and losing, it's essential. His discussion of the likely voter model choices he made, uh, very transparent and upfront, and frankly, very revealing. It really shows that it's, you know, I've always called it special sauce. And sometimes a special sauce is good in the sense that you're trying your best to predict what the electorate's going to be. Too often, though, it's people who want to have a, cl- a close top line number. For to get the publicity, and uh, I put K- Knipiak as the number one current offender. But back in the day when I invented that phrase, it was Zogby. Zogby would just well, you know, he'd get his results, and then he'd say, "Well, I want a result that shows somebody plus two. Therefore, I'm going to assume this percentage of this voter." In, you know, in the waiting process. So when you look at this this write up by by Cohn. He tells you first and foremost, if you look at the, the, the all registered voters, Clinton leads by six or seven. Uh, when you just look at their registered voter, uh, polling, uh, it's six, it's four, I believe in Florida was the result of this poll. Registered voters four, yep. Right. And then likely voter, and what I think is the meaningful one is head to head, it's tied. If, if this, if for some reason, in this particular four-way, Clinton gains, which I think is counterintuitive and probably not right. I think if the four-way was a real thing, and I don't think it will be come election day, I think both Johnson and Stein fade to f- relative insignificance. Well, Johnson uh, uh, Johnson is fading less fast than Stein. They're both fading, but I think what this is trying to say is in Florida, if not the rest of the country, but in Florida, Johnson just might be taking a little bit more from Trump than he is from Clinton, and that's yeah, possible. I guess that's possible. Um, I think that I'm a little skeptical of that finding, but the, the, the numbers are so close. It's, it's so just close; it doesn't watch. much matter. Um, but look, you look at the demos, and that's, I think, to me, and I've said this on Twitter, and Greg knows this is what I believe. At this point in the election, look at the RVs and look at the subgroups, and then apply your model. Look at one finding from this poll that I, I think, that, by the way, I think this poll is incredibly encouraging for Clinton. Uh, because when you model it out, it shows, to me, uh, a chance for actually, to get back to my original point, for not a close win, but a comfortable win. Uh, I'm sticking by Florida uh, being a Clinton state by five points. White voters, 51-30. Obama lost white voters by 24. So Clinton is doing better with white voters. Black voters, it's 82-4. Now, what's interesting about that, that ended up being 95-5 in 2012. Um, and Will it be 82-4 or will it be 90-10 when it's all said and done? Will it be, you know, right now her her margin among black voters is 78%. It's going to be higher than that. The question is how much higher, right? Wouldn't you agree with that, Greg? I would. Okay. That, that's, the whole, that's the whole get out the vote thing there. I mean, right. you know, it, there's no question that to me this is about the worst she's going to do. I, I Exactly. This is a floor. Um the, but no, but just think about it. 82-4, well, what happens to the other 16%? Do they not vote? Well, then let's convert it. So when you look at absolute numbers, so then you got to look at the, the, the likely voter screen and the modeling of what the electorate's going to look like. This poll from New York Times, and it's an honest poll, it's what they're saying, uh, based on their application of their likely voter model, what the electorate will look like. It will be two points more white than 2012. That could be. Uh, no, it's, it's it really possible. can't. It can. It's not possible. It's not going to be. It is possible. And no, it's not even it's possible. It's not going to be. Yes, it is. It, it, <laughs> it it's is. Not, it's not You're possible have for to. this reason, Greg. There are less white voters in Florida. So if you increase the turnout of white voters, you can match 2012. Mm-hmm. To get it to be two points more is 
I just don't think possible. You it's not possible. Things. You have to get more white voters and you have to get less non-white voters. So it's possible. I just don't think it's likely because I don't think that less non-white voters is going to hold up over time. It is what it looks like right now. I, I, I just don't think it's possible. I, I mean, I think it's outside the realm of possibility. I think if Trump can hold it to 67, he'll have done a fantastic job. Uh it's not, I don't see how he could possibly get to 69. There's another reason why I think it's not possible. Trump has no organization. Yes, old white people vote no matter what. They don't need anybody to tell them where to go vote. Mm-hmm. But Trump's gains would come uh, if he can spur white high school or white non-college. White non-college is, is a group of infrequent voters. They're not that different from Hispanic voters. They're a little better, but not much. And to get them to vote, there's two sides to it. Are you enthusiastic? Are you likely to vote? Well, there's that equation of it, you as a voter, whether you're likely to vote or not. But then there's the other side of the question. Can a campaign push you to be likelier? So here's where they just do a fantastic job in the write-up in analyzing the data about two-thirds down. They have this little graphic here which is Clinton's turnout challenge. And that's exactly what they're talking about here. They yeah, talk about support among the voters who are, as campaigns would do, are you uh, more or less likely to turn out? 0 to 10% likely, 11 to 20, 91 to 100. And the bottom line in there, there is the biggest group of uh, voters in terms of scale to size of the electorate is the 91 to 100% likely to turn out. And there... Trump leads 46 to 39. In virtually every other group, Clinton leads. So if you're looking at the 81 to 90, she leads 45 to 38. These are 81 to 90 percent likely to vote. That's her challenge. She gets those people to vote, she wins. The more people in that group she gets to vote, the bigger she wins. Because she has a ground game and he doesn't, it's certainly probable that she winds up taking the state, whether it's three points or five points, I don't know. And the reason is the likely voters are Trump voters. Yes. I mean, this is a, a universe in Florida describing this poll as of today that is as good as it can be for Trump. I just don't think it can be any better. That's the thing. I think polling right now is as good as it can be for Trump. Or look at it a different way, whether it's after the Republican National Convention or after the uh, slip in the polls for whatever reason, you could put whatever reason you want on it, her illness, their description of the illness, the deplorables debate, whether she spent August uh, campaigning or not campaigning and fundraising instead of whatever it was. When Trump does his best, he gets close to a tie. That's at I his agree. best. That's at his best. He never leads. He gets close to a tie. I, and then I, when he slips down, it's worse. And Look, I happen to think that she's in a, a, uh, a bottom of the polling about to come up and starting to come up in a lot of areas. So uh, that's why I, I continue to say it's a tight race, it's a competitive race, but it's a race in which it's not tied. She still leads, and it's likely to be the case. Florida is a fascinating uh, microcosm of that because uh, really it's I, – I think this is the – again, keep in mind this poll was taken over the weekend where she had her pneumonia. So the dates of the poll are like from the day before 9-11 through a couple of days after. So this poll was taken at the time that she looked worse on TV, if you will. And okay. Trump still does no better than a tie. Yeah, and I also want to point out one other thing. When you when you talk about missing voters, you say, well, why, why can't we consider Trump getting more white voters? But t- Trump getting more white voters is not the equivalent of Clinton getting more black voters. She, if uh, if she can talk any black voter, anyone, to, into voting, that's almost certainly one more vote for her. Mm-hmm. If Trump talks a, a white voter, or a white voter is convinced to vote, one more unlikely white voter. It's not as dramatic a win. She leads with black voters by eighty. He leads by white voters by twenty. She leads Hispanic voters by forty. Now, this goes to a question that's being raised a lot here about millennials. And the the reality is millennials, while favoring Clinton, don't favor them as dramatically as do people of color voters. Mm-hmm. 
you know, it's simple math. Should she be worried about a lot of getting, you know, doing millennial votes? Sure, do what you can. But boy, what she really needs to do is get every African American voter out, every Latino voter out. That is the key to the election, not millennial. Driving up black and Hispanic vote. That wins the election. This election, and we talk about it within the context of, quote, economic anxiety, et cetera. This is as stark an election uh, uh, that's divided on racial lines as you'll ever see until the next one, probably. By, by intent, by one party. Yeah, but now we've decided to buy into it, and we well, yeah, have I mean, to. So you might as well highlight it, and, and I think that you're exactly right on that. But this is something that goes back to a, a point we made months ago, which I still think holds up. The millennials are who they are, and uh, if she gets more of them, she wins bigger. If it stays the way she is, she wins. There's nothing wrong with winning bigger. I think that that's not a bad play, just so long as it doesn't distract you from doing everything else you have to do. Yeah, no, I don't disagree. I'm just saying to me, if I if if I'm running their campaign, I'm obviously not. Um, I look. I think deplorables. I think birtherism till the election day. Absolutely. Uh, it, you know, you've got to drive that birther story. It seems to me. And listen, I'm, I'm talking as a cynical, just looking at the campaign. I think it's a huge, important issue. And I know people will say, "Well, you know, the guy's a racist." I believe all that, but also just as political calculation, you've got to make that a top, top issue. Absolutely. You not and, only motivate your own base, but there are still some, I don't know, maybe uh, voters at the fringes who will be driven away by that other basket. Right. Right. Now, you know, look, the, the it's interesting because the splits are such that uh, to get Trump to even requires virtually a, a predicting a 2014 electorate. Uh, we had a governor's race in Florida in 2014, and if it had been any election, any presidential election year turnout, Chris would be the governor right now. So doubt about that. The 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 key here is, I you know, I'm a broken record, making sure that you get people of color out to vote. Now, the age thing, sure. And look, Obama won two to one among uh, 18 to 29s, but they were 15 percent of the electorate in Florida. So maybe it's 14 or 13 or 12. That's two to one. But I, what we can't do is lose our, our nine to one voters. We can't lose our three to one voters. And that's, uh, African Americans and Latinos. Mm -hmm. It's simple math. And, and uh, by the way, the other thing is, I don't know what the, what, what works for outreach with millennials. I really don't. People say issues. I don't buy that for a second. There's no way a millennial is, is voting on issues. And you know why I know this? And I always say this. Uh, why? Gary Johnson. If you were for Bernie Sanders, how in the holy hell <laughs> can you possibly be for Gary Johnson? Uh, <clears throat> he's Gary? pro T. Wait, let me just give you two issues. He's pro TPP and he's anti minimum wage. Well, you could be for Gary Johnson by not knowing a thing about him, which is typically ah. why third parties uh, hang on a little bit. And no, it's it's fade. based on he's not a caring he's, about the issues. He is he he is a vote for. I'm not ready to vote for Clinton, so I'm going to park my vote here. Right. 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 Well, that's I my guess. point. Don't tell me then that issues are driving it. Is my point. All right. I won't. You, tell did, you. you didn't end up with Gary Johnson because of the issues. Yeah, but if we, you were for Bernie. Man. I mean, maybe that's the issue. They never were for issues. They never are for issues. Come on. Listen, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be the impolitic guy. <laughs> young kid, young people don't give a okay. crap about any particular issue. It's all, is it cool to do? Is it hot? Is it hip? Obama was fantastic because he I, I think we need to hip. get this guy a rocking chair and a view of the lawn. <laughs> I, will, I will say, you know, not being a millennial and not being a Bernie voter, although my kids were, uh, I know what I know from talking to them and, of course, talking to the other uh, wonderful uh, analysts and, and uh, dare I say, millennials out there. And I, I just think they're going to be late to the table in terms of deciding. But Well, they uh, always are. we got a long way to go, so it's way too early to presume anything about them. Well, I totally agree with that. Uh, and, by the way, my one, my two cents on how to, how to uh, inspire them to vote 
is negative. It's make the Trump's being not being against Trump incredibly not cool. Right. And I saw some fascinating uh, discussions about that uh, from a couple of different people. But uh, one of the ones that struck me the most, I think, was the whole idea of, you know, back back in the Sarah uh, Silverman days of uh, you had to go tell your grandparents to vote for Obama because it was cool. Actually, it ought to be the other way around, uh, around now. What you need is some of the older voters, African Americans and otherwise, sitting down and explaining why this is important, and you really have to do it the other way. And uh, I, you know, I, the commercials aren't going to do it because uh, millennials don't watch TV, and I don't blame them. TV sucks. So you have to reach them in other ways. But family's always the best way. Friends is always the best way. So that's well, listen, you know, the the, the 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 ads, the TV ad campaign, people will say, well, it's not working. I think it absolutely is working. And the reason well, sure I, it is, is Trump, everybody knows Trump isn't qualified. Where did that come from? Exactly. That and that quality finding isn't shaking. And at the end of the day, for Trump to win, he has to convince more than ten to fifteen percent of the population thinks he's not fit for office to hey. vote for him for president. Funny you should say that. I got a quick piece from John Cassidy about exactly that in the New Yorker which will be in the Pundit Roundup on Wednesday, so you get a little early preview. I'll just read a tiny bit of it, but it exactly uh, is that. Some of those people might still sit it out, but my guess is not many. There's little evidence that Trump's gains have been accompanied by any wholesale revision of voters' opinions of him. Of course, some people might vote for Trump even though they consider him unqualified, perhaps because they think Clinton is less qualified, maybe they dislike her, but Trump still faces a basic conundrum. How can you win an election when your approval rating is under 40 and your disapproval rating is the highest of any presidential candidate in recent history? In the past couple of weeks, thanks to more discipline on his part, along with disaffected Republicans returning to the fold, some assists from the Clinton campaign, it's looked like Trump may have found a way to square the circle, but now that the prospect of him sitting in the Oval Office is more real and salient, the dynamics of the contest are different, and they could well turn against him. And I think that's what's going to happen. Right. No, absolutely. And, and look, there's things you got to look at at polls, uh, whether you believe it or not. I mean, L.A. Times poll, for all all its many faults, let's let's take it at face value and say, OK, well, what are you showing me? And when you show me 20 percent of the black vote voting for Trump, I don't I can't accept your findings. Oh, it also shows that the millennials favor Trump, not just that it's not as big a lead as Clinton would want. But it shows the millennial voters favoring Trump very hard. Yeah, you know, I mean, listen, you can believe that if you want. I don't. Maybe they do in L.A., but I don't think so. Well, there are millennials. You know, and, and that's when college. you get a Trump plus seven finding. I mean, it, it, it's absurd. So th- 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 that's why I say why well, I, I, when I look at it, I look at RVs because, you know, people's LV models, they vary. for the, And that's the greatest thing about Cohn's piece to my mind. He basically lays that look. Here's the RV finding. That is what it is. We and, and a voter file is the best uh, sampling to draw from from an RV finding. Not every state has it, so you can't necessarily rely. Do it yeah. everywhere. But that's Florida a plus four. It. That's an RV plus four, very close to your predicted plus five. Right. If you look at that number, just without looking at LVs. Right. And the reason why I would go higher than that, frankly, is because a lot of the missing pockets are going to be heavily pro Clinton. You know, the undecideds. And I think those undecideds, when you dig deeper, you don't even have to dig that deep. Just look at the demographic and say, well, these people are probably going to come to Clinton. The question is, will they vote? But it doesn't mean that the 82-4, even if they don't vote, you still have to calculate who won what. And it's going to be 90-10 at worst. I think it's probably going to be 95-5. I predicted for Florida it's going to be 75-25 among Latinos. I think nationwide it's going to approach 80%. To, but those are numbers that are winners if the electorate is right. If it's a 75% white electorate, three points over 2012, well, then it's going to be a very close race. You know, Brownstein said the same thing about about this. He did that whole calculation. Okay, assuming it's a 75% white electorate, uh, yada, 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 you know, Clinton wins. That is out of the Kanipiak poll, I believe, um, the last their last national poll. So again, I think one of the greatest things that they kind of did was pull the curtain back, and this is hugely important because you talk about Trump's gains in polls. 
I'd say 75% of it is the switch from RV to LV, right? Right, and we we talked about a little bit with Charles Franklin's discussion of what LVs were, so I, I think that, that that's all true. I have to tell you, I got a very funny note from a cardiologist who uh, follows us online. All right. RV means right ventricle and LV means left ventricle. He said, I've been listening to your show and I've been reading your tweets and you're confusing the hell out of me. What are you talking about? <laughs> He's not a surgeon now, right? So I, yeah, so okay. I had to explain. All right, That's this is funny. Politics. This is politics. Is funny. It's funny how we use different phrases in different ways. Well, yeah. ED, right? That's my favorite still. Right. But I, I, but it gets down to it. I mean, I, the, the problem I have is not so much the polls. People run their polls, they make their assumptions, and they print them. But not being transparent about it. Well, you know, that's where we come along and we help to interpret those polls. You know, the thing of the matter is, at the end of the day, you have to be right. So let's see what happens. You know, the only poll that counts and all of that. It makes no. logical sense what you're saying. It's actually what I expect. The proof of the pudding will be in November. Yeah. Now, I, and I understand the impulse to do it right now after Labor Day. You know, that's traditionally what they say. Okay, well, now we can start seeing what happens with LV likely voters. And they'll say in defense, well, you know, it's, we, of course, likely voters might change over time. So, you know, but the, the problem is when you have that abrupt change and you decide you're not going to talk about your RVs. Yeah, the best your RV polls, findings then, because if you look at every single one of these polls, the like best yellow, polls will tell you both. Tell us both. And tell us why there's been this change. And said, well, this is what happens. Or do LV the whole way. I mean, either way you want to do it. Right. And that's the best thing. And it's always been my advice. If you want to look at change over time, look at RVs because RVs go all the way back. And so same polls, same everything, same universe. At least you get a sense of what's going on. The LVs, as in the Nate Cohen uh, upshot uh, Sienna poll for Florida, are meant – to try to predict what's going to happen on election day. They do or they don't. Some years the LVs are just flat out wrong. In some polls, the LVs are just flat out wrong. So, you know, it, just take it with a grain of salt, look at it all, and get a sense of what's going on. Bottom line is, if you're going to look state by state, Trump has a harder climb than Clinton does. Trump is not winning Pennsylvania, and uh, he may well not win Florida, and if he doesn't win Florida, he's not winning. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, that to me that's been the that obvious changed. first place but to fight. But it hasn't changed, despite the fact that there's, quote, tightening, end quote, it still hasn't changed. Right. You know, and North Carolina now has become the same thing. If he can't win North Carolina, he can't win. He has to win them all. I mean, when we talk about, well, what's Trump's path, and they say, well, if he wins Ohio and he wins Iowa and he wins Nevada and he wins New Hampshire – all that assumes he's won <laughs> he wins Florida all the states, and North Carolina. He's got a really Carolina. good chance of winning. I get that, you know. But but what's the reality? And the reality is it's going to be much, much tougher. And again, keep in mind, there are states like Florida, which you can get a pretty good poll on, like uh, Upshot and Siena did. There are states that are really tough to poll accurately, and Nevada and uh, uh, New Hampshire come to mind. Well, I think it's Just less – I, I think it's not hard to poll registered voters. I think it's hard to predict the electorate. Yeah. Aha, uh-huh. see, that's not polling. Polling is what do you, what, what do you think? You're right? And there's, a, there's no poll that makes sense. You know, suppose there's a poll question, are you going to vote? Yes or no? And the result is 90%. Well, we know that's false, right? You can't poll what the electorate's going to be. You, I, can't, that's- you can't even poll what the electorate was because if you ask people, uh, who did you vote for in 2012? It, the answer generally doesn't match what actually happened. Right. Now, Which look, is part of the problem with the LA Times poll. It's weighted to as if it were. But, I think, yeah, but I think in off-year elections, LV models are pretty good. They 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 actually hit the, hit it pretty well. But in presidential election, I think it's now been proven that they're just not very good. That RVs are at least as accurate, if not more accurate. Uh, and predicting it, as you as you know, I have a continuing beef with the RCP so-called average because it's not an average; it's arbitrary. It's what not that arbitrary average missed Obama winning. It was off by nearly four points. The RVs were much more accurate in 2012. 
Okay. Now, awfully good chance that'll happen here. I got to read you a quick thing before I have to go, and then Armand, if you can stay, you want to talk to David about this. That's terrific. Uh, hey, but okay. the bigger picture here. <laughs> David's is, like, no, we can't. <laughs> what are you talking about? Wait a minute. <laughs> you got to give me more warning than that. So uh, Josh Marshall was talking about one of the many ways that uh, Trump had a not-so-great week. And one of the distinctive ones, which matches his whole idea of uh, Trump's personality, but also in terms of getting out African-American vote, is pretty significant. It's called Josh Marshall and Pastor Timmons taking down yeah. Donald Trump. And this is what happened in Flint, Michigan. If you recall, Trump was invited to do a uh, photo op, which wasn't all that useful to him. He toured a, a empty, turned off Flint plant for about 16 minutes. Then he went uh, to Pastor Timmons' congregation and was supposed to talk about the people of Flint and decided that he was going to talk about Clinton instead. And she stepped up uh and uh, shut him down, and here's how it went. So, a very short tweet storm from Josh Marshall. I love me some Tim Kaine, he says, but come on, Pastor Tim is for beep. I don't think people quite get how much guts it takes to do what she did. Here's my point. There's lots of people who say they'd like to give Trump a piece of their mind. I'm sure they want to. I'm sure some would. I know Armando would. But a presidential candidate walks with a big entourage. He brings armed guards and retainers. He's up there at the podium getting his hate on, and she walks up to him puts a hand on him and says, you won't talk that way in this house. That takes a mammoth amount of self-possession and guts, endlessly revealing. Trump was meek and unnerved. He said, okay, he was rattled. He quickly ended his speech. She was calm, collected, polite but firm. Like every bully, he cowered. But it sets off all sorts of bully, psychic, mojo, horse crap inside of him. <laughs> and that's hmm. why he was back to torch his campaign, lashing out at everybody uh, within hours. And he has got a little piece about that which is called uh, the fever inside, which is pretty decent. But quite simply, mm -hmm. Trump felt neutered by a black woman, and she did own him, and he couldn't bear that. I'm not sure whether Trump is a bigger misogynist or racist, but being set down by a strong black woman was more than he could handle. And you could see the whole story in this, almost the whole story in this photo. Look at his expression and look at her. So really nice piece in terms of what happened there. The thing is, Trump is Trump, and if you give him enough time, this stuff just comes out. He can't help himself. He can't stop himself. And one of the things that is always, you know, the underlying assumptions about these polls is that if nothing changes between now and November, but there's a lot that's going to change between now and November. A week from today, we have the first debate. Everybody's going to be watching that. And Trump is perfectly capable of being a jerk on any given day about any different, uh, any given topic. So that's going to have to fit into the mix as well. I'm going to leave you with that while I scoot off to work. But this is Greg Dworkin speaking with my friends, David Waltman and Amanda Lawrence, who's going to talk about, uh, you know, how I'm wrong and why the polls might be right in this particular case. And, uh, it's, it's just, it's a fascinating dynamic and, uh, you don't usually get to see so much psycho. We haven't had this much psychodrama in a candidate since Nixon. It's really kind of fascinating. Take care and, uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right. Thanks, Greg. Watch your left ventricle. Uh, yeah, there. absolutely. And the right one, I guess, while you're at it. I'm going to go to work and yell at some cardiologists. It always Please. makes me feel better. <laughs> take care. <laughs> okay. Don't you, you don't sneak up behind a cardiologist. They can't take it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, they don't like that kind of stress. Wow. You know what? That's an interesting place to – I'm going to put that one aside. But uh, I, I guess the first time I saw that uh, piece from Josh Marshall, I, my first thought was it didn't really feel like that important a moment. Actually, but I mean, he makes a good point about it. Certainly, and it's a, it's a, maybe something for strategists to look at. I don't think that uh, Hillary Clinton can recreate the same kind of moment. It's not the same kind of context. They won't. You can't do it in a debate, for instance. Uh, but yeah, that that one that is kind of interesting. There, the, he, he, just for a second, he realized this really isn't a podium I control. I didn't pay for the microphone here, <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that's anything that can be recreated, and so therefore I think it will end up as a as a minor moment. But but it does. Yeah, tell it us is a, a minor something. moment. But I think there's a related uh, incident that happened uh, the Friday, which was okay. Uh, Trump was going to be dominated, which is the you know the dominance politics is what Josh talks about mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. On the birther store, he was going to have to retract, right? Yes. 
that one. But he turned it into an event he dominated. And in fact, he was so pleased with how he dominated and the press being all pissed about it hmm. that yeah. he retweeted uh, Chris Eliza, of course, who said, you know, Trump was Trump's greatest trick ever. Right, right. So so he turned his uh, 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 an event that where he was going to be dominated uh, into one that he could spin as being dominant. But, of course, that's dumb because what he dominated was uh, the lying. And that's how it was treated. You know, that winning yeah, you winning by saying, ah, I, I fooled you guys by lying to you is not particularly a winning moment for a pre- for a candidate, not even for Donald Trump. Yeah, it does fit but, with his uh, making them wait and all of this. That's That's like the oldest trick in the book. Right. Exactly. I don't know if he was so brilliant about it or not. I think fooling the media is, is frankly, child's play for for most. Uh, you know, let's say have a hard on for you like they do Clinton, in which case you can't. Even if you do it right, you're going to get blasted. Mm. So, uh, but that's, you know, I w- as I said, I wouldn't really be that proud of, of that moment. But it's also just not politically effective because they end up saying he just lied. He lied to us. He's a liar. And, you know, it's been Trump is a liar for three days, Yeah. which, you know, for better or worse, isn't what he needs. He's supposed to be the guy who tells it like, like it is, right? Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> whatever. I don't know. I, you know anyway, you know, you were talking about this New York thing. And, yes. again, I, I actually am kind of proud of everybody in a sense. And let me be positive about something for once. No, the, 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 the measured reaction to it all both by New Yorkers, New York, for the most part, the media. I mean, Fox News doesn't count. Fox, the you know, the New York Post, they don't count. They're not media. They're not journalists. You know, they're just pro- yeah. propaganda arms of of whatever they decide they're going to be propagandizing for. Um, but everybody else handled it pretty well. Even this morning, then they announced, "Oh no, it's a scary Muslim." It sounds like based on his name, maybe he's not. And by the way, innocent until. Proven guilty, right? Let's not presume this guy actually did it, though. I would suspect that this is based on surveillance. So the evidence is probably pretty strong. Nonetheless, you know, let's reserve judgment. Uh, First, obviously, let's see if they can apprehend him. Presumably, he's still in the country. Yes, Um, tweeting that that he's they've got it down to uh, he's driving a blue 2003 Honda Civic with New Jersey plates and put the plate number out. So I don't know whether he's on the move or what, but... I assume he might have changed cars if he's anybody. But what was fascinating about <laughs> he's it... not, or he would have bombed a better spot. Okay. Hey, I, I mean, you know, I, this is... Nobody got hurt, so I can make this joke. You know, Muhammad Ott is shaking his head in died. disgust yes. at this guy. You know, I mean, what kind of terrorist are you? You give terrorists a bad name. And you screwed it up for all the terrorists that were going to work this week. Because now everybody's on high what? alert. Yeah. Yes, that's true. They don't coordinate. So that's one of those things that you have to deal with. Uh, somebody might steal your thunder. Yeah, I'd screw it all up for you because all of a sudden now security is going to be super duper high. Oh, that's that's one of the, that's one of the downsides of the distributed network uh, <laughs> of the, of the, the yes. non-existence of an organization. We just yeah. inspire people, right? <laughs> we don't we don't do the terrorism. We just inspire the terrorism. What is that's the old consultancy commercial? Right? We don't do the things. We just we just recommend them. Exactly. Right. We just say, you know, do what you can. Okay, but what if that screws up everybody else's try attempt to do do, do what they can? No big and deal. And the answer Perfect. is, well, that's the way it goes. That's how when you run a a decentralized organization, right? And you, you can know, say, those hey, things you're a martyr. What are you worried about? I screwed you up. What? Your martyrdom? You can do that anytime. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Man, we're terrible, aren't we? Yes. Well, right. Uh, as you know, uh, yeah. The uh, the, the the Trump deplorables were furious at uh, over the weekend with me. I just it was I just treated it as a terrific opportunity to do mute purging of my likely <laughs> voter rolls, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they uh, oh they've they've spent the whole election tweeting out their stupid speculations or their accusations that uh, you know Hillary personally murdered everyone at Benghazi, whatever. Uh, they did not very much enjoy having the tables turned and and. Uh, Tweeting out that uh, that Trump himself had personally planted the bombs, or that uh, 
<laughs> which I don't think I got around to that one. But but I did I did worry that when they when they found the second device, but not immediately afterward, I, it did. I was like, you know what? I just I just want to put it out there. I don't know if this is the case, but I hope some deplorable didn't think, oh, I'm losing the Twitter argument that it's terrorism. I better. I'm gonna take that old pressure cooker that I, I never use. I'm gonna dump it in the trash bin and call 911 and say I saw a Muslim. You know, but so far that hasn't surfaced. So thank God no, for that. I yeah. mean, not yet, but you never know. But the yeah, the, the well, funny thing I, a I got be in your face. Anything can happen. I, the weirdest thing I got from the deplorables this weekend was yes. I was attacked uh, with a ton of anti-Semitic. Uh, attacks on me, and I was like, yeah. "Dude, get the right <laughs> form of bigotry here." I, I, I'm, I'm not sorry. Jewish. I'm, I'm I'm one of the dirty spicks. You're <laughs> supposed to call me a beaner or something. Right. That's not the meme I have, man. I can't do anything. I'm sorry, and so I have the anti-Semitic memes in my folder, and so everybody's Jewish as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that's what I thought. So that's pretty lazy, man. It's right there in my name. You know, it's not that hard. You know, uh, well, yeah, pull maybe. out the beaner stuff, right? Well, they thought you were a uh, Sephardic Iberian Jew. Yeah, you and, know, of uh, course, the the I, I might have <laughs> mentioned this before, but it, it, I, I think uh, my brother did the genome project, and based on ah. uh, on what uh, he's discovered, it turns out that uh, my people were were the cowards of the of the Jewish race back in the day, uh, back during the Inquisition. We we quickly capitulated uh, and converted well yeah you know i mean uh, there's a lot of pressure <laughs> they were the yeah, trump the, of their the, day the, the rack the, the rack uh, concentrated the minds of the lorenzas we were all we 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 revealed <laughs> our cowardice very quickly well torture works as they say uh like i said these uh, torquemada is the trump of his day he yes. knew that uh pressure could be applied you you profile these people uh the Inquisition knows who they are, but the uh, police are afraid to act. But not the Inquisition. <laughs> no, they were not. We'll, we'll, we'll show you. They use some enhanced interrogation, I'll tell you. Yeah, that's right. It's going to be um, <laughs> it's fantastic. When we torture people, it's going to be beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it, it was something else. So, I, I, you know, I'm actually kind of curious to see what the day two and three story is of this. This guy presumably will be captured at some point, maybe not. Sure. Um, then we'll, you know, do the whole uh, parade of, you know, what does it mean? Does he have a cell and all that other stuff? Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. It just didn't seem to penetrate. I don't know. Maybe NFL got in the way. It just doesn't seem, doesn't yes. feel like as big a story, Trump does it? That's a point. That you can't have a debate opposite an NFL game because look what happened. They had a bomb opposite an NFL game. Nobody cared. Yeah, oh my God. You, well, you know, i got to say, he's got a point a little sure. bit in some respects. It's, a, it, it, it's just, well, I don't know. Maybe our attention span is just w what it is. You know, and if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. And while there were some minor injuries, you know, there was no deaths and no serious injuries, thank God. Um, so maybe that's why it uh, didn't have such uh, such resonance. Yeah, well, it was a it's a bad spot in the news cycle, and New York didn't panic, and even really the you know the the good old USA heartland didn't even panic because most of them probably said eh, New York, you know, so what. So and and the, the immediate reaction from New Yorkers, which I think one of the first quotes that I saw was, "Yeah, you know, it's a it's a burning dumpster." You see that from time to time in New York. You know, they, they don't often explode like that, but I mean, people were out getting ice cream in the neighborhood pretty quickly thereafter, and uh, yeah. it just didn't it just didn't scare people. And, and there was lots of potential there with another bomb being found in. New Jersey today, they find more bombs in a train station, an Amtrak station in Elizabeth, I think. Uh, yeah, I heard that too, and, and I'm like, Elizabeth, huh? That's interesting. I mean, I mean, are, the, it, the, it, 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 I guess, soft target or something. I have no idea. I guess, or you know, it's around the corner, you know, from where you live. So you bomb it, I guess. I, I don't know. There's, there's been some very Weird thing. I, I like I said at the beginning of the show. I've often thought that the, if they really had it together and they really wanted to panic America, that these are the places that. Well, 
actually I kind of thought they would hit things that are also soft-ish targets but are are much more impressive targets. I mean, I just think about how many places you can bomb gigantic gas lines, you know, uh, appear to have nothing but a uh, chain link fence around these these transfer stations that come up above the ground that the, the whole country is laced with explosive gas lines and they've never thought to do that. And I hope they don't. But throwing bombs in a garbage can in a train station, eh, I don't know. So far it hasn't worked and thank God for that. And, and, and uh, it is interesting also to watch Trump, uh, I guess, scrambling for something to say about the things and to keep the panic among his troops up uh keeps insisting that the police they're terrible they're ha- we're hamstringing them they're afraid to they know who these people are and they're afraid to act because they will be accused of profiling but i mean of course the big issue around the country is they keep shooting people for almost no reason how afraid are they really for one thing and for another uh we just the cops just found one bomb disarm it they find a bunch more you know they're actually they're doing pretty good if you're finding the bombs before they explode, that's an A plus. I I don't know why the why the criticism of the police at this point, but that's be, well, it's because Trump at bottom, you know, police are servants to him, and uh, if they're not uh, dragging people out in the streets and beating them in support of his political agenda, then they're lazy losers. <laughs> God. Even though they've endorsed him. Uh, that was another interesting development over the weekend, beginning part of the weekend. Fraternal order of police. A uh, little, little issue with the timing, I think, uh, to come out and endorse him, like following the uh, deplorables issues and uh, uh, look, it was. his lies about uh, you know the, the press release and just having a terrible day on Friday because he blew it on his supposed press conference and and out they come, uh, but yeah, they they endorsed him. Keep sending them grenade launchers and uh, tanks. By the way, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, I mean, the the, the police unions. Uh, I don't know all of them. I know the one in New York. It, it is uh, basically awful and racist. It very often uh, makes people forget that they're pro union when you talk about police unions. Yes, and police unions also forget. That they're a union yes. and that Republicans are anti-union. Uh, uh, that, that's certainly true. But, uh, you know, those – to me, that that is what it is. I mean, you're not going to find the answer to the issues uh, that have been raised on policing from police unions. I mean, it's almost ridiculous to, to pay attention to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have no interest in even addressing – the issue of police violence. Uh, and, you know, maybe they, that's the role they think they should be playing. But, I mean, to me, it's not worth um, worth even really engaging them. I mean, it, no, I'm sure, I'm sure that it would be better issues. to have gotten his, gotten their endorsement than not get it. But yeah. uh, no, it, I mean, it's to me, be, look, no doubt look, about it. Yeah, this is a slightly different take. You remember our good friend Robert Crookshank? Yes. Also Eugene at Daily Coast for so many years. Um, he and I have been having what I articulate today, this running debate on millennials and, and what you do for them and what you can. Like to, he, he thinks it's the key to the election. we got to focus on millennials to get them to win. Obviously, I don't agree uh, for the reasons I stated on our show before. Um, but it's... I do think there is a certain, oh, well, should she reach out to disaffected Republicans? Should she reach out to white college educated? Should she? She needs to reach out to people of color. Those are the people who are going to vote for eight, uh, five, four to one. There's no more important group to get out to vote. And everything, that's the North Star if I'm running the Clinton campaign. Well, Republicans uh, agree with you. That's that's why that's why they, they you don't hear about let's purge millennials from the voting rolls. Let's make it difficult for millennials to get ID. Right. I, I agree. And I also just you know, I'm I'm gonna revisit this point, but I think it's important. What's the magic bullet? What's the secret formula for getting millennials to come out to vote? 
I just don't think it's a set speech at Temple Universe, which is what she's planning to do today. Well, no, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't, if that's the play, if that's the reason. There's plenty of other good reasons to give a speech at Temple, I suppose. Go ahead. Why not? No, but this is, you know, to convince millennials and to do a registration drive. I mean, look, it it doesn't hurt. Don't get me wrong. No, no doubt about that. I don't, I mean, I think one of the things I would think about millennials is, uh, I mean, if we're talking, and what even is a millennial? I guess what we're we're talking about. 18 to 34 is the definition. Yeah. But, I mean, is it? They're so disparate and different in the whole identity at that age, and not because they're this particular cohort, but everybody at that age wants almost more than anything to resist being categorized. So it's, you know, what will work with people who insist that they, you know, that, that their individuality is paramount. I, oh, I agree. Know. And what's, what's supposed, what, uh, yeah, what is the millennial issue? That's it's climate right. change. No, it isn't. It's stop yelling at us. Yeah. It's, you know, may, uh, you, know you could argue uh, about jobs maybe and student loans. I had some maybe free college, but that's – once you're out of college, of free college doesn't really mean much for you, does uh, it? Well, no. I guess unless you think you'll get your loans forgiven after the fact, but no, I, I – yeah, yeah, you know, I mean if I was Trump, uh, I would just lie and say what we're going to do is is cancel all student loans. I guess. Or, you know, and I think the other thing is this, for, is this decriminalizing pot thing. I, I mean, if we're talking about issues that they're going to care about. Listen, I'm not saying all millennials are potheads, but for some reason that issue does resonate among millennials. Yes. So, you know, like for example, in Florida, you want to get millennials out. I don't know that I can get them talking about Hillary, but there is a referendum on the ballot that – uh, is for de- not decriminalizing, but uh, basically loosening the controls on marijuana. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know the exact parameters of the of the of the proposal, but it's it's going to make pot easier to get and use. It's going to be delivered by Uber. That's the millennial issue. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, okay, that captures the. Attention. <laughs> it's going to be delivered by Uber. I'm sure that already exists. I hope so. Yeah, you yeah, hope so. My God, if not, someone's missing out. Yeah, I think that's actually a. I, I think I saw a promo for it, either a movie or a TV show that's actually sort of premised on that. So the, the idea is already out there. I don't know what. Yeah. I, okay. So Temple University speech is that today? Yeah, it's today. Millennials don't do Mondays. I'm fairly certain of this, but okay. I, that's what I. This is what I'm getting at. They don't do Mondays. They don't do set speeches. Let's be honest. They don't do Hillary Clinton. Yeah. That's not. Yeah. You, there's 50 days to the election. You're not going to make voting for Hillary Clinton cool. You got to find another way. <laughs> not with Pokemon Go jokes, that's for sure. I, I just well, what <laughs> with those jokes or anything else. She's a 68 year old woman. All right, and that's who she is. All right, so there's no. She's not Obama. She's not going to be cool. She's not going to be any of those things. So what's the solution? Don't tell me. Maybe that's the speech, selling though. Hillary to them. I thought of one thing, and yeah. I don't know if anybody agrees with me. I think Mark Cuban has some some resonance in the in uh, because particularly because of his uh, ownership of the Dallas Mavericks NBA franchise, and he had an interesting interview in Bloomberg about how he examined Hillary and found out that all the claims about her dishonesty and just dis- untrustworthiness were complete nonsense. I thought, well, maybe if Cuban or somebody like Cuban actually addresses that. Maybe that has some impact, but I don't know. I really, I think that there's a certain fool's goal to to this. They're, I I just think they're either going to be inspired and enthused to vote against Trump, or they're just going to do what they're going to do. Uh, well, yeah, I would I would guess. I mean, that's I, I certainly you don't. Uh, justify your paycheck as a strategist if you just say, eh, I don't think there's anything we can do. <laughs> maybe, maybe yes, maybe well, no. Well, you know, a very good person and a very, you know, excellent surrogate for Clinton now. She used to work for Bernie Sanders. Simone Sanders, yes. you know, had this sort of tweet storm about talk about the issues. And I'm like, what do you mean talk about the issues? Who am I convincing uh, among millennials? Uh, um, about the issues. Uh, it's, listen, if that's you think that's the hook, 
to make to make it cool to vote Clinton, or make it uh, not cool to have Trump be president. If that's the the game, sure. But I mean, on the substance, I just don't think. Look, I have a millennial daughter, twenty two years old, and she was all in for Bernie. She gave my money to Bernie. <laughs> you know how that works. Mm, okay. I gave her money, and then she gave it to Bernie. I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? Uh, and you know, she she's crunchy and she's granola, and she cares about this, she cares about that. But believe you me, mm-hmm. it wasn't about that. It was about hey, it was cool to be for Bernie. Uh, in my opinion, yeah, for a lot of people, I'm sure that's true. And and you know, it, it was different and interesting. And and for some substantive reasons, and uh, there I'm sure are some who dove deeper into the issues, and then there were others who said, eh, "People are doing it. People are getting weird tattoos of that cartoon profile of." of yeah, you know, I mean, think of, of something those. like this. You know, there, Jill Stein, who uh, is horrible. I mean, objectively, she's a terrible politician, but then she says today that Clinton will be worse for climate change than Trump. Because she knows how to move the levers of Washington. Yes. Donald's quote, Not Donald Tom. Trump, I think, will have a lot of trouble moving things through Congress. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, won't. Yeah, oh. I'm sure uh, I'm sure Paul Ryan is all in on that one. Mm-hmm. I mean, but the argument here, forget about the stupidity of it. What's the point of this argument? Ah, uh, I'm not. I'm not what sure. is she trying to do? Convince She's, people not to vote for Hillary Clinton? I get, I, yeah, I mean, I guess in a sense that, I guess in a sense she's trying to run what would be a traditional campaign in, the, in meaning. She's at two percent. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll attack the person who's ahead because that's where the votes are, and it's like, but you're not getting the votes. Why don't you just focus on your platform and your issues right. and Let, let's assume for example kind of that uh, tax what, at this what, point don't make what, sense what stein's trying to do is get the five so she gets the, the federal funds right she needs to go after gary johnson he's the one that's getting the votes she can get yeah i guess so i don't know I, think there, about it i mean no basically real those votes for the most part at least at least half of johnson's votes are are protest votes, right? Mm, yeah, I would guess. That's where she can get votes from. She needs to go after him for for supporting TPP, for being against the minimum wage. Why am I sitting here analyzing Jill Stein's vote? Because I actually loathe her, because there's nothing positive about what she's doing, even for her own cause. It's the weirdest campaign ever. It's not, she's not, yeah. she's gone beyond, there's no difference between the two, which Ralph Nader ran. Now Hillary's worse than Trump on climate change. Yes, of course. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know how you advise a campaign at 2%. So it's just scattershot, whatever they feel like. And I'm sure they don't really have advisors per se. And uh, yeah. and I think she's irrelevant Yeah. At, yeah. at the end of the day. Johnson actually has more, more potential for, for hurting Clinton. As a repository of, 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 well, I'm not voting for either of them. Um, and in that sense, um, you know, it, it's punching down, so Clinton can't do it. I don't know how you do it. How do, how do you get people to know about Gary Johnson? I don't know. Because you really want him to be somewhat unacceptable for a Democratic leaning voter anyway. Yeah, I but I don't know how you, to do, how you get to it. Uh, what's Aleppo thing, but. Well, I mean, that gets old people. I mean, he's not getting older people. He's, he, his entire vote is concentrated almost entirely in, in millennials. Uh, that, that's, that, you know, he's getting whatever, 30% of millennials, 35% of millennials. She's getting 10 of millennials. That's why she's at two and he's at nine or eight or whatever he's at. Uh, mm-hmm. I personally think that most of those aren't going to vote. Uh, that's where they're going to end up. But if there's some way to get some of them to come to Clinton, uh, that would be, you know, if I'm going to focus on millennials, I'd focus on people who are saying they're going to vote for Johnson for whatever reason. Hmm. Yeah, that's maybe why yeah, you do I a big pot so. proposal. I mean, <laughs> if I've of all the things I've heard, you know, talking about legalizing pot is the one that would make the most sense to me. Uh, well, yes, in terms of uh, capturing their interest, yes. 
I don't know. Yeah, it seems I, to succeed, and, and people have been strategizing about that for a long time for Democratic campaigns, that you want to have a referendum like that on the ballot to get people out on the assumption that they're not going to come out and say, yeah, I would like to legalize pot, and I think the guy to do that is at that time, whoever the Republican nominee is. But uh, instead they're coming out and saying, good, I'll come out and vote for the referendum and Gary Johnson. Uh, well, it's possible they'll do that, but wouldn't it be interesting if you can at least get them out, and if they're for Gary Johnson and they're for the pot, you, they say, well, I'm here, I might as well vote for Hillary. I mean, I think at the end of the day, remember, the day of the election, everybody's going to know there's two possibilities to be present. You're going to know that your vote for Gary Johnson is meaningless. Yes. Unless you care about him getting federal funds. And I just don't think that's the that's gonna almost be. never entering the minds of your voters. No. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's something. I suppose you could really kind of micro target your your outreach and say, uh, listen, uh, come out and by all means vote for the referendum, legalize pot and then make a, you know, then do something serious for president. Well, I'll just like, I'll give you, got you one the example pot legalization here. directly here. You've made your vote. You don't need to make a protest vote in favor of pot on top of the fact that you actually just voted to legalize it. Gary Johnson can't help you if that's the only issue that interests you. You just did it for yourself. You don't need Gary Johnson. Right. And but but think about how you can attach the, the idea of voting for Clinton with it. I don't know. Uh, you could have her endorse the, the referendum. Measure. Yes. Right. Well, that, I guess that's the. The idea, and I guess <laughs> she's not interested in doing it, uh, and that's what makes millennials say, "Yeah, see, loser." Well, that could be, and, and and as I said, I've heard about speeches about this and that. I, I just, I just don't buy it, except for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in Florida, you know, I'd look, I'd take a close look at whether she should come out and publicly endorse it, and maybe give a speech about how we're not handling marijuana properly or something like that. Yeah, and she, and she could do that. She could certainly do that and, and, and be perfectly uh, in line with other things she said. Yeah, there's be- nothing that's out of That wouldn't make anything out of the ordinary. It's I mean, maybe she would argue that, issue. well, that goes against my concern about the heroin problem. But I don't think so. I don't think people think of them as comparable, but maybe they do. I don't know. But as I said, if you're worried about it and you want something concrete, I mean, all I hear is, oh, you got to reach out to millennials. you got to do stuff. got to talk about issues. I'm like, I just don't – I've never seen an issue that That's makes issue. much sense to, and that really penetrates except pot. Maybe the student loan stuff hmm. or free college and perhaps. But that's about it. Don't tell me they care about uh, about uh, – Tax policy, and they don't. You know, I'm, 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 I'm pretty politically correct in saying young kids don't know nothing about nothing. <laughs> they don't. So well, they're they're, they're, they're they're taking detailed looks at your policy proposals. Come on, they're not. Yeah, you're confusing them with hipsters at that point. I guess. I Who guess. also aren't really looking. But I, that was my excuse to say, come on, hipsters take a look at the websites and you look at the policy proposals on the two candidates websites this one is yes it's very long and you won't read it but that's because it's artisanal the other one is off the rack walmart policy you don't want that (laughs) yeah but they like the candidates in the box right yes well but yeah right but uh well packaging is everything you get we have the right kind of box over here all right well i don't know i'm not certain that uh that they know how to Reach them yeah, out. I, I, that there's I, any so way everybody of says do it, and I'm always my question no is it. how. It, 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 I guess that's the same question ultimately. I don't know how. I don't know if there is any one thing. I don't know if there's any set of ten things that works for them. But I, the, the one that I guess has, stands the best chance in terms of bang for your buck, anyway, I guess would be. Well, everybody says the marijuana issue seems to be the thing, so. Why not find it? You want to find it. Of course, you, the moment you do that, there will be people who say, well, this is pain. Well, that's a mistake. You can't do that. You're yeah. going to lose white working class or yada, yada, yada. Yeah, right. Meanwhile, that's, who's doing all the – yeah, all right. Uh, that's what I'm getting at. If someone tells me the way to do it, I'm all for it. Mm-hmm. I just don't think it's quite as simple as saying do it. It's like Trump's solutions to our problems. Right. Well, I will do it. do it. 
I will make it happen. Believe me. Uh, what? Day what? Are you going to make what happen? I don't know, but it'll be day one that when it happens. Right. So I, I would pr- propose the same question to all everybody. Says, well, you have to go after millennials. Okay, how? What do you think she should do? Talk about issues. Well, I, you didn't convince me with that one. What's your next idea? Yeah. I mean, that'd be, I don't know. I don't have any other ideas except for the, yeah, the, the pot thing. Or maybe the thing you said, you know, maybe uh, maybe the speech needs to be, look, uh, I am Whoa, who I sorry am. about this. that. Hold on. I got this thing playing behind me. Oh, I didn't even notice it. But, you know, maybe the speech needs to be, um, I am who I am. I'm a 68-year-old woman. I don't have any magical answers about how to reach millennials and i don't think there's any magic way of doing it either and if if there's anything that defines millennials it's that they would refuse to be defined by certainly by anything that anything as stodgy as a traditional democratic nominee's campaign for the presidency would come up with so you know it, it's going to have to be a take me as a ham sort of thing you you want to talk about issues Let's do it. What what issues you want to talk about? Let's uh, is it, it am I insulting you by saying it's the pot issue? Am I insulting you by saying it's the free college issue or the uh well, however you want to frame it. You know, help with student loans I don't lowering know. the cost. I did. I don't know. Right. She goes ahead and does a uh, you know, lowering the cost of college proposal and the answer is well, you know what it looks exactly like Bernie Sanders's plan. Maybe, exactly. maybe it does. Is it, Wasn't that the that idea? A good thing, supposedly? Right. That, that, that was the plan, right? Remember when he, remember way back before you actually supported Bernie Sanders because you'd never heard of him and he made a speech and he would tell the newspapers why I'm running. Why are you running? I mean, Hillary, everyone knows it's Hillary Clinton's got a lock on it. Nobody knows who you are. Why are you running? Well, I, I at the very least, I want to be able to keep her on the straight and narrow and pull the Democratic nominee leftward. Like how? Like by proposing free college uh, or something like it, and then maybe in the end, the Democratic nominee, in order to capture my voters, says, we got to have something like that. So she does, and they all go, oh, you. But that's what he said he was doing, and now he did it, and you're angry. Why? <laughs> well, it should have been him. Propo- yeah, it should have, but it wasn't. So now what? Now what? You want to take it? No. Urgh. All right, you want to talk about <laughs> pot? No, I that's mean, absurd. You're again, it's their vote. Me. They get to use it or not as they wish. Mm. I just think that you can't overthink these things. There's no magic bullet that's going to make it happen. There's no magic way of approaching this. And no. I've yet to hear one that makes sense to me. Uh, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, uh, I mean, let's see. To let's be see honest, if she maybe she's already got it figured out and she's starting to implement that plan. I, maybe I, I, I just know. hope that people don't lose the the thread here. It's going to be people of color that win this election for Hillary, and she needs to yeah. get every one she can to get out to vote. And, and I, I was I expect that's exactly what she's actually doing. And well, why isn't she paying more attention to millennials? Because the real answer is that the election will be won elsewhere. It will be great if they come along. We want them to. Uh, They don't want to be pandered to, so we're not pandering. (laughs) Exactly. But 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 do pander, but don't make it look like pandering. Because then, if I accept your pandering, I look uncool. So what I want? What? What? I don't know. And I don't know. Maybe there is no, not even any such thing as a millennial. There's clearly an age cohort, but. That doesn't unite anybody. I've never. Well, they have some shared views. I mean, it's interesting that one of the, the most uh, persistent ones is rejection of of the bigotry that that encap- that encapsulates the Trump campaign. I guess that's why I, I, I do think that deplorables and and uh, going after Trump's bigotry is a a good way to appeal to millennials. I Make guess. it uncool yeah. to not vote against. Trump. And I guess that's true, but they, yeah, and but it has to be further than that. It has to be oh, well. Remember also, it's uncool to vote against uh, any way except against Trump, and that voting for these third party candidates is, is a vote for yeah, Trump. I mean, that's essentially it. I, it's, it's. I'm funny. I'm just uh, having this vision of millennials out at a protest and and doing one of the favorite chants, you know, and saying the the people united will never be defeated. Hey, where are you going? Going to vote for Gary Johnson. 
<laughs> I'll be right back. The yeah. people Gosh. united. We'll never, I'm voting for the 2% candidate because, you know, integrity. Yeah, I, I mean, I, again, you can decide that that – uh, your vote for Johnson is fine. You don't really worry that Trump might be president, but you know, just accept the consequences of it. And you know, I think you're. Uh, don't be upset if I think if I call you stupid. It's your vote, I, but it's my my opinion, and I can call you stupid for doing it. You know, that's not blaming. Mm-hmm. That's basically describing, right? Yeah. Oh, well, I, that's what I don't get. No, everybody <laughs> else gets to be called stupid, but we can't call the young kids stupid. Why not? Uh I don't know, cause they're kids. Be nice to kids. I don't know. I guess. <laughs> I I, yeah, that does it. I don't know what to do uh, about it. I don't have any answer. For I don't it. either. Which, I, which that's my whole point. I don't think anybody it. does. But yeah. I think that's sort of my point. Uh, but there's no. The, nobody really has come up with a comprehensive. Well, this is what you should do. Yeah. Plan. Give I'm a saying. speech at Temple University. No, I, I, if someone came to me with a proposal and start, and the first thing they said do was give a speech at Temple University, I'd be like. All right, this this isn't this isn't a serious attempt at this, you know. Uh, it, you don't, you're not going to reach anybody with a set speech. It's going to be on TV on the on CNN. You know, who watches CNN besides us? Old people. Yeah. Young people don't watch CNN. Young people don't watch MSNBC. They don't. Yeah, uh, the speech should be on Periscope. I don't know. I, have no I don't either. That's what I'm yeah. saying. You know what? Neither do they. So good. Temple. Temple will be it for the day, and uh, that's okay. And and maybe this is maybe this is just a thing. Like you know, well, how will you address millennials? I don't know. We'll give a speech at Temple University. Well, that's not going to do it. Uh, but that's okay. It doesn't matter that it's not going to do it. The point is, we're going to someone in the media is going to ask, why aren't you, you know, reaching out to millennials? And they'll say, it did a speech. It, Temple University. There. Yeah. There, I yeah, did it. I did. Okay. I, I got one last it. insight that is completely arcane and stupid, but I'm going to bring it to you, then hand you back your show. All on right. this Florida thing. Okay. There are about 200,000 new residents of Florida who are eligible to vote, who are getting registered, who are from Puerto Rico, who will have no voting history in the United States. Hmm. So through the typical likely voter model you've never voted before Mm. how likely are you to vote now well you'd be probably listed as pretty low right yeah puerto ricans vote like nobody votes i mean from the island Hmm. if they get registered they will go vote that is their routine that is their habit that's how they live voting is a part of life not voting isn't Hmm. those people are all likely voters and they're probably being missed by all the screens. I think there's another 100,000 votes missing from polls in Florida because of that. Yeah, all right. Well, that's probably you – know, what's how, why is that happening? 200,000? Yeah, Puerto Rico has had, over the last two or three years, tremendous economic problems. Yes. They are United States citizens, so they can come to the country whenever they want, and that's what they're doing. So they're just saying for economic reasons, they're just moving – and there, a lot of the movement has been to Florida, particularly the Orlando area. Okay. And it's my view that uh, that likely voter is not being captured at all. Um, it's only a point, maybe, in the mm. at the end of the day, but yeah. a point's a point. True. Well, okay, that's an interesting thing to look for and a good insight. I guess that's uh, that wouldn't necessarily wouldn't show up in your likely voter models. And without some sort of personal knowledge, I guess no real reason to guess. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, listen. Puerto, Puerto it's, as I said, it's a marginal thing. But if you wanted to be a little more accurate in your model, you might ask you know, them: Are you Latino? Are you Puerto Rican? Did you come from Puerto Rico in the last two years? And I would, frankly, designate those people likely voters. Yeah, I guess. Or you can certainly ask: uh, What was your? You know, did you did you always vote? Did you? Were you a habitual voter in your last registration? Yes? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, sure, I guess everybody would say, yeah, sure. I'm a terrific Yeah, but they'd be telling citizen. the truth. Yes, that's true. It's just that, <laughs> because we know that everybody because would turnout, say that. Turnout of eligible voters in Puerto Rico elections on the island is 85%. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. 85%. How you if we crack 50, it'll be a miracle. 
I don't know how you would design a poll question to get it. You just have to have confidence in it as part of your special sauce and say, all right, this is what I know about Puerto Ricans in particular, as opposed to like, well, I'll just ask everybody, are you registered newly in Florida? If yes, then were you where you know where were you registered before? And uh, if they say Puerto Rico, then you can't. Well, that's not really much of a poll. Uh, well, no, you. I mean, you could add it in your LV model. You, yeah, you could do it. I mean, it's a few extra questions and it costs money. Uh, the the pollster would, uh, and the call centers will will charge you more for it. But if you wanted to be a little more accurate, again, it's going to be a point. Yeah. You know, and I think that's probably not uh, worth then it that. that's what you do. But look, I imagine there's a million other ways you could also refine your likely voter model. Yes, um, and uh, that's just one that I know for a fact. Yeah. Okay. Well, I I, I think it's a great insight. Certainly something to watch for. And I, I feel like now we've got something. It, should it happen, or should you hear about it in the post-election analysis that people will think back and say, "Hey, now that I remember hearing on K Grow in the morning." Armando told me. No wonder. Okay. <laughs> that, that, well, yes. certainly if they say so after the election, and it was this enormous influx uh, of habitual voters from Puerto Rico. I heard it. I heard that. Okay. Yes. So, well, if that happens and you hear it after uh, on election night, yeah, you heard it 19th, here first, ladies and gentlemen. And it was talking like a pirate day. Must credit breaking. Our, our, ye must credit. Our, ye must credit. Uh, I forgot all. Of that. <laughs> That's the worst. <laughs> Okay. Well, all right. A lot of pirates. All right. Puerto Rico. Good okay. luck with the rest of your show. I'm sure it'll be wonderful. I'll be listening. Okay. Terrific. Thanks very much, Armando. Do vote. I encourage you to do so. All not right. just because bye, you're bye. Puerto Rican. Bye. Okay. He's not Cuban. <laughs> okay. Anyway, but but he's but but extensive experience living in Puerto Rico. Okay. So I'll take his word for it. Right. You should too. What else can we catch up on? Uh, let's see. Uh, by now, it's probably no point in doing it as breaking news sort of thing. But as I said, uh, all throughout the show, the news organizations and police organizations have been tweeting out like they're closing in on the person they now will identify as a suspect. Uh, and they, they now are willing to connect the New York and New Jersey incidents. Matt Schlapp's support of oops, Donald Trump has some, cost him terrific, friends and got Washington's some, elite There we are. See if we can find our auto-playing video. That brought to you by The Hill. Thanks very much. Oh, and Justice tells me for some reason feed coming in has dropped for a moment, but it's back strong now. So, okay. Well, uh, let's see. So what are they showing us over at The Hill? They're, they've taken a clip from CBS News. This is a piece I opened for the headline, which was Republican Friendships Shatter Over Trump. A little curious about that one. It was illustrated with a photo of Trump and Chris Christie. So I thought I'd take a look at this one. A few months ago, Matt Schlapp, that's a hell of a name, and I've heard it before, too. It rings a bell. Schlapp is S-C-H-L-A-P-P. Schlapp is the former White House political director under President George W. Bush. If you recall, George W. Bush was actually president of the United States, astonishing as it now seems. Schlapp walked into a cocktail party a few months ago and tried to join a conversation with Republican consultants he has known for years. The conversation quickly ended. Schlapp, the chairman of the nation's oldest conservative grassroots organization, I don't know what that is, told The Hill in a recent interview, everyone looked down at their expensive loafers. I hadn't had that happen to me in a professional setting before, he added. It's one of those moments when you wonder, hey, do I have something on my face? Schlapp's decision to support Donald Trump for president oh, has cost him friends in Washington's elite Republican circles. Invitations he would normally receive no longer arrive. Boo-hoo. So sad for you. Uh, it's, it's a schlap in the face, ladies and gentlemen. It just had to be said. The vibe, he says, he's getting is you're out of the club. Well, you are. You're deplorable. Sorry. Can't really help you with that one. Uh, he's hardly alone. Old allies in Washington and across the establishment Northeast are no longer on speaking terms because one backs Trump and the other loathes the nominee. Divisions have run so deep in some cases that they could take years to heal. And I hope they never do. Mike Duhame has witnessed what Schlapp is living through on a larger scale. Duhame is top political advisor to New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. 
In late February, Christie became one of the first Republican leaders to endorse Trump. The fallout was brutal. Go get me a Big Mac was probably a part of it. Christie got publicly trashed by the GOP establishment. His endorsement was called disgusting by former Bush aide Tony Fratto. Former Mitt Romney advisor Ryan Williams accused Christie of kissing Donald Trump's boots. That's not what I thought he kissed. The governor was excoriated in a public letter by his former finance co-chair, Meg Whitman, who now supports Hillary Clinton, and ridiculed on Twitter for alleged indignities, including fetching Donald Trump's McDonald's order. Christie disputes the McDonald's story, but then remember, Christie also disputes that Trump has advocated birtherism, so you can pretty much effing forget about the uh, truth behind that, you know, that being true. Uh, okay. There aren't a lot of people with the courage to go up to his face, Duhame said, of the attacks on Christie. Well, that's always been true. A lot of the vitriol has come from people who are extraordinarily brave on Twitter. Outside the professional political class, however, Christie gets treated warmly, according to Duhame. That contrast between Beltway iciness and warm reception in real America is an experience commonly described by Trump backers in the party. Senator David Perdue, among the most full-throated Trump supporters on Capitol Hill. What's his throat full of? Oh, I don't know. Donald Trump, I would guess. Says the positive reactions he gets in his home state of Georgia are unrecognizable from what he hears inside the Beltway. Perdue hasn't lost any Washington friendships over Trump, mainly because he was never close to many of the Trump rejectors in the first place. He believes many veteran Republicans in D.C. can't relate to political outsiders. Therefore, anybody who's in the Republican caucus here that's pulling for Trump is a little bit seen as askew, said English major Purdue. And the reason is he's not of Washington. Well, you know what? Neither am I, added Purdue, who, like Trump, came to politics late in life after running large companies and is now the only Fortune 500 CEO in Congress. Another Trump loyalist to feel that divide is Jeffrey Lord, a veteran of the Reagan administration and Trump campaign surrogate on CNN. Home in Pennsylvania, people who've seen Lord on TV stop him in the grocery store and say nice things about Trump. I like that you lie for him. That's really terrific. When Lord attended the glitzy White House correspondence dinner, however, he got a different reception. You're an idiot. That's true, too. A Republican from a prominent think tank, Lord won't say who, attacked Lord, telling him he'd betrayed conservatism and Ronald Reagan by supporting Trump. Lord said the title of a Hollywood tell-all book, You'll Never Eat Lunch in This Town Again, describes the sensation he now feels when he visits the town he once called home. On May 3rd, Ari Fleischer, White House press secretary under Bush from 2001 to 2003, tweeted, There's a lot about Donald Trump that I don't like, but I'll vote for Trump over Hillary any day. A former colleague of Fleischer's, Fratto, the Bush aide who criticized Christie's support, replied in a tweet, Then we don't have anything to say to each other. Fratto told the New York Times that Fleischer's betrayal was unforgivable. You were the White House spokesperson when Trump said the president lied the country into the death and maiming of people unnecessarily. He told Times of Fleischer, How can Ari be okay with that? Ooh, that's... That's curious. <laughs> ah, there's a third way around to uh, enjoying this disagreement. Asked about Fratto's reaction, Fleischer told The Hill, I've always, I'll always have something to say to Tony, whether Tony wants to say anything to me or not. That's okay, I got something to tell you both. Fleischer believes these deeply personal reactions are peculiar to Washington. Now he lives in New York and works in sports consulting, where he doesn't lose friends over political differences and also doesn't do anything important. One of the most wonderful things about being outside of Washington is people differ on politics but have a lot more important and other things to talk about, Fleischer said. I just think it's important, he added, not to let the politi a political difference, even over Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, rise to the level of personal rancor. Okay, well, we'll see what your reaction is when you start getting uh, memes about putting you in ovens, but whatever. Isn't that what's wrong with the system? I think the ovens are what's wrong with the system. So open is the contempt for Trump within certain D.C. Republican circles that some have calculated that it's better for their careers if they kept their, keep their support for Trump a secret. I've always figured that to be the case. A senior House Republican staffer who works for a committee chairman doesn't tell his colleagues that he likes Trump or that he informally advised the campaign. Basically, nobody knows what I've done, said the staffer, who asked for anonymity for fear the impact his views could have on his career. 
as it should. It's not something I talk about openly at work because there are a lot of strong feelings still among the staff. People talk openly against the guy because he sucks. He worries it might harm his reputation if colleagues discover he's a major fan of Trump. I've always felt I would be viewed in a different light. He said I think they would have pegged me as being all the things the media has said about Trump, that he was a racist, a misogynist, and a xenophobe. Well, they do say those things about Trump, but chiefly, I think, certainly my view is not so much that he's a racist, misogynist, and a xenophobe. I think he exhibits those characteristics from time to time. The real problem is that all of his supporters tend to be racist, misogynist, and xenophobe with even greater gusto than he himself is. And guess what you are? You're a major fan of Trump. You might have been found out. Over drinks with colleagues after hours, however, the staffer is finding a growing number of colleagues who also secretly like Trump. They think they will escape the ovens, I guess. It's kind of like you're doing this weird little sort of dance around it, he said. You haven't admitted to them that you're supporting the guy, and they haven't admitted to you that they really like the guy. And you get to the point where you say, I kind of like what he says about this, and they'll say, well, I kind of like that too. It's, it's like they're meeting on Grinder. Weird. Perhaps the only Beltway politicos who aren't losing friendships over Trump are lawmakers themselves. None of the Republican congressmen interviewed for this article said their support for Trump had ruined friendships on Capitol Hill. I have good friends of mine in Congress that have, some, have come out publicly and said no to Trump, and our discussions are quite frank, said Representative Bill Schuster, chairman of the powerful House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. And I keep telling them, just think about the Supreme Court when you go in there and you don't pull that lever for Trump. Representative Brian Babin in Texas has similar experiences. I hear colleagues saying, well, he's not a true conservative. He insults people. Babin responds that Trump makes mistakes because he's not a politician. And you don't have to be a politician to recognize the problems this country faces. That's a pretty simplistic view of things. Uh, is there more to it? I mean, I, I guess I'm mostly interested in, uh, we'll go jump to the conclusion. Uh, although there's only a little bit left here. Um, one of the reasons these pro-Trump lawmakers don't get attacked to their faces might be that they're imposing characters themselves. I'm known to be a little bit of a maverick, said unknown representative from Pennsylvania, Tom Marino, an early Trump backer. Marino's response to skeptical colleagues, well, how's it been going the last 30 years? Of course, the answer is richest country in the world, best health care system, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, stock market over a bazillion or whatever, but I'm sure... Uh, it's a total mess. Believe me, it's a total disaster. <sighs> Last bit here entitled, Putting the Party Back Together. We'll see about this. Schlapp attributes a lot of the anger of wounded pride to wounded pride within a consultant class that failed to grasp the Trump phenomenon. Maybe. If you were someone who spent your whole professional life making predictions, selling your reputation for understanding politics, he said, I think this gets to the core of their pride and ego. Hmm, I'm going to dismiss that because... That's what Kellyanne Conway was doing, and it was easy enough for her to just say, you know what, I'll take a contract uh, saying the opposite of everything I said before. So I don't know if I'd buy that one. Schlapp, Bush's former aide, said the message voters are sending, that Washington is broken, and the people running Washington are not listening. That's true. I'm not listening to that. Gets to be a very personal message if you're living in those zip codes. He hopes when this election is over, whether Trump wins or loses, establishment Republicans can reconcile with Trump supporters. In the meantime, Schlapp and his wife face an awkward stretch until Election Day. I can't tell you the number of nights we've looked at each other and kind of felt a bit lonely. Woohoo, he said, laughing. He's just kidding. It's personal. It's painful. It's people you grew up with, he added. In politics, you make these really great, deep friendships because you work long hours and it's about issues that are important. When those relationships break because the issues are no longer important to you, it's really heartbreaking. But it also motivates you to say there's a lot on the line, a lot of emotion involved, he added. And screw it, you got to do what's right. Well, too bad you're not doing anything close to that. But, uh, okay, good luck to you. I hope you, you know, fall down a sewer somewhere. But uh, I hope it's over quickly. Anyway, let's see. Uh, there are a few other interesting things that we might bring up. There was something in here that uh, reminded me of... Of something there. Let me just uh, scroll up to the top here. What was it that? Uh, hmm. Uh, oh yes, that's right. The fact that the guy was a former uh, Bush aide, and I, I saw something over the weekend that I thought was interesting. And now uh, I guess one of the the things I didn't 
put aside. I didn't think too much about the possibility that I'd be talking about this one, but I did see tweeted over the weekend that I guess they asked Mike Pence, uh, who is your role model for the vice presidency? I don't really know, like, in what context that came up. And, and it doesn't matter in the sense that, in all likelihood, you know, well, who cares what your role model is for the vice presidency? You're not going to be the vice president. But he, we treat him with a certain kind of respect because he's the vice presidential nominee of a major party. And uh, prior to Trump, he was an elected official. Uh, he was a total and complete uh, loser. But, uh, you know, whatever. He was a traditionalist type Republican. So I guess you ask them questions like that. But it occurred to me, well, he, he answered, first of all, it should be said that uh, Dick Cheney was going to be the, uh, or, you know, was his role model for uh, the vice presidency. Who <clears throat> I, I picked this one up from Caroli, who uh, who wrote it up for Crooks and Liars. So I guess I'll open that piece up so we can see, you know, where did this come from? Mike Pence calls Dick Cheney his role model for VP. Uh, and uh, her notes on this one, uh, it's actually Heather is the, uh, I, uh, the, the person who actually wrote this one up. I saw Caroli uh, tweeting it, but Heather says, uh, just what we need, a Dick Cheney wannabe in the White House. Here's Vice Presidential nominee Mike Pence explaining to ABC's Martha Raddatz who his role model would be if, God forbid, Trump gets elected. And it comes down to this, uh, Dick Cheney. And she says that's the kind of vice president you would want to be. Well, I think a very active vice president. Vice President Cheney had experience with Congress, and so do I. And he was very active in working with members of the House and Senate. He's hoping that – I mean, I, he took the gig because I think uh, – the theory here is that uh, Trump was going to hand uh, day-to-day operational control over to him. I don't really believe that that's necessarily the case, but it probably sounded good enough to get Pence on board. And, you know, in Donald Trump's world, he's like, well, look at that hair. He's sort of vice presidential, right? It's not as good as mine. That's why he's vice president and I'm president. Anyway, what really occurred to me was, uh, I mean, we were we were being handed this headline for good reason. It's a ridiculous choice to make. Dick Cheney was a terrible person, although as as a vice presidential uh, as a vice presidential role model for a Republican, I guess that's that's where you would go. First of all, uh, you don't want to insult one of the few remaining living Republican vice presidential role models that there. Are, I guess, but his choices were limited. I mean, everyone was kind of agog that he would choose. Well, Democrats were agog that he would choose Dick Cheney. And, you know, I, I suppose that wouldn't surprise Republicans. But it occurred to me, what choice does he really have? If you look back at Republican vice presidents, he's not got a lot of options. Uh, if your mind went orig- instantly to George Herbert Walker Bush, vice president for Ronald Reagan, you should keep in mind, of course, that Bush has been pretty adamantly anti-Trump. So he's stuck. He can't choose George H.W. Bush because that, you know, he's been so clear that he's anti-Trump and that angers the man himself. So he's out. So what does that leave you with? Dick Cheney. So okay, that's a name everybody remembers. I'll go with Dick Cheney. Republicans won't mind. Democrats will go wild, but who cares? Because the other choice is Dan Quayle. That can't, oh my God, God help you if you say, yeah, Dan Quayle's my model for the vice presidency. But what else? I mean, we'll go back in in time, right? Dan Quayle isn't going to be it. Spiro Agnew can't be it, right? Can't say that. Maybe you can say Jerry Ford, but he's not, very fondly remembered you know, as a serious and impactful guy, even though he became president. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how people feel about that one. George H.W. Bush is out. Nixon, Eisenhower's vice president. Yeah, and you can't say Rockefeller. Rockefeller is reviled inside today's conservative circles. So who has he got to choose from? We have to go back to like pre-World War II 
who's and who's going to say who was Herbert Hoover's vice president? I don't even know. You have to look that up. That can't be your role model. You have to go back. To, I think people were answering me and saying, well, I guess you have to go back to Teddy Roosevelt, I guess, in order to find somebody that certainly the Democrats would find acceptable. But I guess that that brought me to the realization that, wow, that's some maybe that says something about this modern Republican Party. There hasn't been a like a decent human being in the vice presidency, thanks to Republicans, uh, for quite a long time. Not not that there hasn't been one in the vice presidency period, but I mean the vice presidency as occupied by Republicans. When Republicans get to choose who's going to be the vice president and win, that's who they give you. Dan Quayle, Spiro Agnew, Nixon, Mike Pence, I guess, Dick Cheney now. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Gee whiz, what a coincidence that this party full of, you know, total lunkheads, uh, produces a historic run of, well, lunkheads who you can't look to for a role model no matter where you look or how far back you go. So I thought that was kind of an interesting commentary, one of the lesser noticed issues, I guess, over the weekend. Uh, let's see. The, just to catch up with a few things, maybe we'll uh, toss in there, and we'll spend the rest of the week catching up on more in-depth on some of these things because uh, there's interesting things about Mike Pence. Uh, there was a nice piece put together. Uh, by uh, well, the one I picked up was from Jezebel. Actually, get to know Mike Pence and all of the very bad legislation he's signed, and that will take us some time to get through all of that. But uh, he's he's not gotten a lot of scrutiny in all this. Not only because people don't think they're going to win, but be, um, Trump sucks up all the oxygen. But if you believe for a minute that he's really going to leave operational control to Pence, then I guess you're going to want to spend some time figuring out what he might do with it. There's also very interesting reporting that we'll get to about uh, the size of the government subsidies, i.e. tax breaks, behind the Trump empire, which, you know, presumably makes people think, oh, my gosh, he's so hypocritical. But, uh, yeah, I know, it won't change any deplorable minds. There are also a few uh, pieces of uh, various bits that we might toss in there. I think it's important to take note of this one. A reporter arrested at a campaign event. I thought that was very interesting. Covered by Vice News, which stands to reason since it was the Vice News reporter who was arrested. But uh, arrested in Houston. Alex Thompson, reporter for Vice News, arrested by Houston police today. When was that? That would have been Saturday, the 17th. While inquiring about press access to an event held for Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump at the Omni West Side Hotel. This sounds a little odd, this one. Thompson was arrested roughly 1.30 p.m. uh, Eastern time, anyway, charged with trespassing. He's currently, at that point uh, that the article was published, being held at the Houston Central Jail. Vice News requested access to the event earlier this week, was told by the Trump campaign that its status was pending. I'm not really sure what that would mean. And I guess if my status was pending, I'd do what he did. Thompson entered the lobby of the Omni to ask members of the Trump communication staff whether a final decision on access had been made. At which point, a man who identified himself as a hotel manager then asked Thompson to leave and warned that he would be arrested if he did not. Roughly two minutes later, without further warning, and while Thompson was waiting for a member of Trump's staff to clarify his access to the event, he was arrested by Houston police, handcuffed and escorted outside. Thompson spoke with his editors while handcuffed and said he was never given any opportunity to explain himself to police. A call to the Omni seeking comment hadn't at that point been returned, but there is an update uh, 6 p.m. Saturday. A spokesperson for the Trump campaign replied with the following statement. The campaign was not involved in this incident or aware of the details surrounding it. The event organizers were responsible for today's media presence and requested the campaign limit attendance to the traveling pool campaign had no staff presence at check-in for guests or media and therefore has no further knowledge of what occurred. And in an 8.30 update, the Houston Police Department said hotel management initially asked the man to leave the building and he eventually complied and left. Soon after, he entered the hotel a second time. When asked to leave by management, he refused to do so and told hotel employees that they would have to have him arrested because he wasn't leaving. So I guess they obliged him on that one. 
Thompson, by the way, released on bond uh, by about uh, eight nine o'clock that uh, evening. So very interesting. And a side note, I did see tweeted out. Uh, uh, just so happens that Thompson, a former uh, assistant, I guess, to Maureen Dowd. Interesting job description. And I guess uh, somebody noted that it was just very curious that uh, the day Trump came down on Dowd on Twitter, her former assistant, now working as a reporter for Vice News, gets arrested outside one of his events. Confusing. You can't tell with these guys. But, you know, not good optics. But somehow the optics, you know, not a major point of discussion today. Uh, last thing I want to toss out there, and we'll discuss the deeper implications of it, but I just want to get it on the record. I know the after show will likely be discussing it later today, although I can actually look that up now, I think, if I got my notes from Justice. Oh, not yet, but uh, uh, note, note to you. Just there we go. Uh, let's see. I can tell you for sure whether it's going to come up. All right, not today. But it's been discussed in the past. I believe it will come up again. Yet another NFL team, I guess, threatened by the local police department that they're not going to escort their players around anymore, I guess, or provide security, perhaps, uh, when they work overtime at the stadiums. This time, the Dolphins, uh, Miami Dolphins, had a couple of players join in the uh, ever-widening protest surrounding the playing of the national anthem before games. And once again, a police union uh, insisting that uh, we're going to pick and choose who we protect and serve based on the way we agree or disagree with the way they exercise their constitutional rights, which is not a good look for police organizations or any organization, really, but in particular police unions. I thought it was very interesting, and somebody isolated a piece of this and uh, the leader, the president of the union, the police union, mind you, I guess, has been commenting that, uh, well, you know, some t- in some jobs you give up some of your constitutional rights and your freedom of speech when you sign your contract and you put on the uniform. And, and he actually means the football uniform, which was pretty amazing because I think that's actually maybe something he was thinking about for himself when you join the police department and put on that uniform. Then maybe one of the things you do is not criticize the way people exercise their First Amendment rights elsewhere. But, of course, uh, he's a union president. He knows that the players will have a contract somewhere that will have mentioned nothing whatsoever about giving up freedom of speech rights. But I thought uh, it would be fun to make one up out of whole cloth anyway. So we'll return to that and to other issues we got to get uh, buckled down on the rest of the week. It was fun to let Greg and Armando go wild this morning, give me a chance to rest. But now... Time to get serious with Metaphor Monday on the After Show. We'll see what we can cram in about the action-packed show to come. A New Jersey woman uses coupons in a quest to feed 30,000 people in need. A new study concludes that one out of every five corporate bosses is a psychopath. And Rose Pak, a San Francisco Chinatown dynamo and city power broker, is dead at age From Daily Coos Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the k in the Morning Show. With David Waltman. Now here's a crystalline example of what can go on on the after show that we sometimes miss. The last half they'll be reporting on the largest prison strike in history. It's happening right now, virtually ignored by the corporate media. Luckily, you're not listening to the corporate media. You're listening to Netroots Radio, and you're staying tuned for the after show with Wink and Justice next.